so thank you very much for uh, the introduction, the kind invitation here. So as you said, my main interest in research is software. So I'm interested in, in what is software and how to build software. So I try to share my, my, my view on that. And first, starting with a very you know, high, uh, high level of a view of uh, w what really is software. So we'd like first to compare uh, the, 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 the process of writing software with the process of creating a, a scientific uh, theory. So just uh, probably, of course, you're all scientists, so you, you already know that, but to make sure and to, 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 to agree on definitions, uh, coming from uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, there is this notion of scientific theory as an explanation of an aspect of the world that can be repeatedly tested in accordance with the scientific method using a predefined protocol of observation and, uh, and experiment. And so the scientific method involves the proposal and testing of hypotheses by de de deriving prediction uh, and so on, and then performing this experiment to see whether the, the, the preconditions are valid, the, sorry, the, the prediction are, are valid. And so we see the, the, this notion of the model being central to, to scientific theory because the model is an abstraction of an aspect of the world for a specific purpose. And thus, any scientific theory uh, is a model. The reverse is not true, of course. There are many models that are not scientific theory, and I'm not going to, to be uh, you know, too, uh, um, uh, too controversial, but you can, I didn't mention uh, astrology or homeopathy or the like, but you, know, you, you see what I mean. So my point is that nowadays creating a scientific theory is writing software. Actually, it's even more writing software. Because the fact is that uh, in the past, up to the 20th century, mathematics used to be the language of, of, of science. Uh, uh, when science was simple enough for math to handle it, basically. Um, if you look at a very simple example in physics, such as uh, Newton's uh, 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 gravity th theory, uh, if you have two bodies, then there is a, a theory explaining the, the universal gravity, and then you have an analytical uh, solution for that that can be produced through mathematics, and of course, if you have these analytical uh, uh, solutions, then you can solve the system, and that's beautiful. But as soon as you have a third body in, in, in the picture, as soon as you have three bodies, then there is no analytical solution for that. Okay? So the only way to predict the evolution of a three-body system is actually running a simulation. Okay? And uh, so you can do it by hand, of course, but it takes a long time. So what is possible now with computers and software is that you do it in, in, within computers and uh, you simulate it and then you can have the evolution of galaxies and the like using computers. So my point is that as soon as the problem is complex enough, then mathematics is not able to handle it and then you resort to software and computers. And most of the science, and that's a big move that we are seeing nowadays, is that in all, nearly all the sciences, there is this movement toward uh, having computers as, and, and software as the language of science for providing models, making predictions, and checking these predictions. Okay? Of course, it does not mean that math is to be forgotten, because math is still there. I mean, when you're do, doing this simulation, actually the, the base operation, the basic operation, uh, are based on mathematics, of course. Okay? But to make it possible to have, to have the result, you need software and computers. <coughs> so creating uh, uh, scientific theories nowadays, building a scientific theory is writing software. And I would say that conversely, uh, writing useful software is really like creating a scientific theory. Why? Because you typically when you have, you know, you have to build some software somehow for, to fit some purpose, some, some need, some requirement. So you have to start with a, a problem in the world, in the real world, okay? And then you have to understand this real world, to understand what are the rules, what are the, 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 the laws, and what is there. And typically what you do is that you build a model of that, okay? Like in science. The model is not just there because the model is one thing. The other thing is that if you build useful software, the software must do something. 
with respect to this model. Let's do some computation. So we have something that we can call a function, a functionality of the software, that somehow you mix, you compose with the model to get what you want the software to do. OK? But that's what we call software. But the software by itself is useless, unless you have a computer to run this software. OK? And so you have this notion that Jackson's called the machine, which is made of the computer running the software. So, and the software for me is the composition of the model of the world with some functionality that I denote with this uh, uh, x being an operator. Okay. So here I have a machine that does what I want to do with respect to the world. But then uh, the question is, does it do what I want? Which is the same question that scientists are asking. Does my model conform to reality? Is it possible to make prediction that I can check on, uh, with respect to reality? And so what I do, of course, is that I'm going to test it with respect to the world to see whether my software is useful and so on. So the process is really similar of creating a scientific theory. So there is a big parallel there that is very important, and I will get back to that. Um, <coughs> so this notion of the world and the machine comes from uh, Jackson. Um, and if we look at history of when in history uh, some uh, software has been introduced in, in, in several domains, it always follows the same story. First, it's there to model the world, to provide a kind of simulation. Let's take in, uh, you know, in business, in telecom, the first software that has been written, or even with weaponry, I mean, uh, the very one of the very first software that has been written is, was to compute the, the, the angle of guns for, for, for Navy, uh, for Navy uh, ships. Uh, so it's really to model and to know stuff about the world, to mimic what's going in the world. Okay. The second step is that once you have this model, you can say, oh, but I ca actually I can connect this model to the real world by using sensors that provide real information extracted from the world and populate an instance of my model into my computer. And then I can ask questions to, to my model, not just in a abstract way, but with respect to, to what is actually happening in the world. So the second step is monitor. Okay. The third step is that as soon as you can monitor what's going on, then you can control. It means that you can run some computation and then act on the world. Okay. So uh, once again, it's uh, the case in, in all these domains that at first you can simulate, for instance, in, te in telecom, and then in the end you compute and then you switch and you do some packet switching uh, with software. So this is the, the, the typical evolution of when software is entering one, one particular domain. And then there is uh, uh, something which is not the purpose of this talk, but it's worth mentioning here, which is that sometimes the, 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 the evolution is that the machine and the software becomes the world. Okay? You, you already know that because you know the notion of bank account. In the past, the notion of bank account, you know, it's, it's a box where you put your money, and then you put that in the bank, and there is a you know, something and the bank is keeping your money. But of course, you know that nowadays it's not really money. It's just, you know, some information on, or, or some data somewhere in some computer. Okay. So the, the notion of reality of money in the bank does not really exist. It's just software. If you look more recently at the, the, the notion of a, a free hotel room or a free seat in a, in a flight. Okay. Uh, if it does not exist in Expedia or that kind of, of websites, it does not really exist because you don't know it, it, it does exist. Okay? And because you do not know it does exist, it means that really for you it does not exist. And that's somehow a danger because the reality that you see is actually provided by these people such as Expedia and the, and the others. Okay, so it becomes your, the, the reality that, and there is no way, or, or it's not really that there is no way, but it's very difficult for you to find the real reality behind the interface that is provided there. Okay. But let's, let's, you know, that's not the topic of this, this talk, but uh, still it's interesting. Well, there is a big caveat here, and it has been already mentioned by other people in, in, the, in, in, in today. 
First, <coughs> uh, so a machine is made of a computer, a model in, in a function. The first thing is that a computer, uh, if you look at modern processors, actually nobody knows any longer what they are doing. Okay? Of course, if you're running some logical computation, you're pretty sure that it's going to produce the right result, provided, provided there is no bug there. For floating point arithmetics, it's already a little bit more difficult. And if you look at stuff such as how much time does it take to run this computation, how much power does it consume, actually it's completely non-deterministic and nobody knows. Okay, so what the computer is doing, what the processor is doing, nobody knows really what the processor is doing. Then the model, by definition, it is an abstraction of an aspect of the world, meaning that it is wrong. It is always wrong. It is incomplete, partial, and wrong. Okay? And then the function, it's what do the user, I mean, what is the purpose of your software? The problem is that most users do not really know what they want. And this is one of the you know, the, the reason why methodologies such as agile uh, kind of stuff is very helpful because it helps users discovering what they want by receiving many feedbacks during the construction of the, of the, uh, of the software. And uh, if you try to formalize that in the term of, of real requirements, actually in the end, most of the bugs in a computer software are trust to bad requirements. So you do not know what the processor is doing, your model is wrong, and your functionality is not good. Okay? So are you serious? Do you really want to board this plane? Okay? So what's the solution? Well, it's not original, it's there for decades. Uh, actually, it's the goal of software, the way we build software, is by leveraging two big ideas in science, which is abstraction and separation of concern. Um, so we need abstraction on hardware, we need uh, uh, abstraction on models, but their models already have abstraction and separation of concerns because there are aspects and abstraction of aspects of reality. And function must be understood, abstracted, you must know what's going on. And then there are two problems, two very different problems. One which is, are all these abstraction consistent, okay, which is what Brooks called uh, uh, do the right thing, uh, so, sorry, do the thing right, okay? And then you need apply math, proofs, formal method for doing that, okay? Checking the consistency of your abstractions, which is important, but it's only one side of the picture. The other side is that does, the, uh, does it do the right thing? Which is really, is it close enough to reality for the purpose you're, you're trying to pursue? And that can only be checked through testing. Okay, to check with whether it's close to, to the reality that you want to, 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 to address. <coughs> and so, of course, the, the story of software uh, is really uh, uh, trying to progress toward better abstraction and separation of concern. So we can see that there is, uh, if we look back at history, there are three main uh, 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 key, uh, key way of doing that. The first one is the, the historical approach, which is uh, the idea that somehow the composition of the model with the functionality somehow compile is completely intertwined. Okay? So it's typical when you're programming Fortran, C, or you're doing control automation, it's the way you're doing it. And why it's the way you're doing it? Because it's probably the most efficient way of doing it. Okay? But of course, there is no separation of concern. And then it's very brittle in the sense that it's very difficult to change the functionality or to change the model without rebuilding everything. So when you have something which is small, that's not a big issue. You just drop it and do it again. No big deal. But when you have something larger, it's starting to be very difficult. So um, uh, this is why I, I put a, an end here. It does not mean that people are stopping using and programming that. It means that during the 80s, people discovered that this could not be the solution for all kinds of systems. As soon as the system is bigger, more complex, you cannot do that. Okay. So there has been this subject-oriented revolution that started actually in, during the 60s with the idea of the Simula language. Uh, the Simula language, as the name uh, puts it, is that it was built for doing simulation. Okay. And then it was seen as, as a good 
paradigm for building a program because the idea is that the model is still there explicit in the code. Okay? So somehow I would say that the, the composition of the functionality with the model is somehow interpreted by the, by the machine. Okay? Uh, because the model is still there and so it's easy, or relatively easy, to build a new machine, a new, a new software, by, uh, pro by changing the functionality without touching too much the model. Okay, so it makes it possible to modify and to have a better separation of concern between the model and the functionality that you want to provide over this model. And that's the core idea of object-oriented uh, design, programming, and all these object-oriented languages that are, that are there for many years. So it started really in the, in the 70s with small talks and uh, in an industrial way in the, in the 80s with C++ and generalized to industry with Java in the, in the 90s. But soon enough, uh, there, there is still a big problem there is that uh, it's still very difficult to keep a good separation of concerns with technical concerns. Okay? So if you have no technical concerns, I mean, if you are running a single user software on a PC with no fault tolerant issue, no big deal with performances and the likes, it's, it's very good. But as soon as you have issues such as handling persistency, security, fault tolerance, a performance issues such as speed and the like, then all these things cross-cut to the model and the rest of the program, they are very difficult to isolate. Okay? So the typical object-oriented way of programming, let's say, a bank account, you just want to credit some money, you know, you just the, 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 the amount of money is just uh, incremented by some value, but then in reality it's not the way it's implemented in a bank. You have to build a transaction, to handle persistency, you have to build fault tolerance, you have to take a lock on the database, you have to do a lot of stuff that is unrelated to the model and the functionality, but that does that has to, to handle these technical concerns that are very difficult to separate. Okay? So what people are trying to do for starting in the 90s is to try to keep a better separation of concern uh, by having one language per concern and to have this, uh, this composition still there at the machine in such a way that you can change one without changing the others. Okay? So to have somehow the interpretation of all these compositions. So actually I tried to come up with something a little bit more formal than that, but I could not do it. But that's the, 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 the idea of, uh, of keeping the separation of concern up to, 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 to runtime. <coughs> And so my point is that writing f software is, or actually will be, uh, composing abstractions described in different languages. Okay? So that's the idea that uh, we, we have uh, modeling and weaving. Modeling is the idea of separating concerns and abstracting. So by definition, as soon as you have a complex software, you have many models describing many different aspects of your software. And then what you do when you're, you're a software designer is that you take all these different concerns and you try to produce a design for your software that you're going to produce and, and to, to be uh, incorporated in, into a machine. And of course, that's not new. I mean, that, that's the thing that any designer in the world is doing on an everyday basis is, you know, looking at some data model, uh, reliability model, uh, and so on. And then in his head, try to compose everything to come up with a design model that handles everything. Okay? So what's the, the, the issue? The issue, of, of course, is that in many cases, you have variants. You have several security models. You have many platforms. And if you do it by hand, you have to redo the, this kind of weaving process manually. And because you're redoing it, it's tedious, it's costly, and so on and so forth. So one of the big challenges is to try to automate this weaving process, to try to automate this composition of these many aspects. We know how to separate aspects, we know how to describe them, but it's still an open challenge to compose them in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, general way. We can do some stuff, but not complete. And that's, of course, connected with, with product lines, because in, in any software, in any big software today, you, just, you do not want just to address one specific version of the software, but depending on the many countries and the many kind of customers you have, you have many, many variants of the software, and you have to handle that with, with, with that. <coughs> so, complex software intensive system, there are multiple viewpoints and many stakeholders. There are many, uh, many concerns, including technical concerns. 
uh, multiple domain expertise, and we need languages to express them, of course. These languages must be uh, make it possible for experts to work in a meaningful way with them. They must be tool support with a lot of things that we know that are useful, analysis tool, code generation, verification, validation, which are still extremely costly to build. And the other thing is that you separate the concern, but at some point, this concern must be integrated. Okay, and that's an issue. So, just to give you an, a, a very concrete example of that, there is this Jhipster uh, 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 platform nowadays that is very popular for people bu building internet applications. The idea is that it's a development platform for generate, develop, and deploy Spring Boot plus Angular web application and Spring microservices, which is all the things that are used in industry in a very large scale. And they are using generative approach for doing that. So it's possible to generate a modern web app containing all of that. And we try to count how many languages they are using. They are using more than 40 different languages. More than 40 different languages for this generative framework. Okay? So it means that already people are using these things in a somehow uh, uh, artisanal way for producing stuff that is very, very used, heavily used in industry. Okay. <coughs> so the limits of, of general programming languages, you know them probably, uh, uh, is that they, they are powerful, but they are not usable by all stakeholders, including non-programmers. The, 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 the idea of, of domain-specific languages is that instead of having you know, the Swiss knife, like in the, the previous talk, you, you, you want to have one tool for each task. Okay? And the idea is it's supposed to be easier to use and more efficient. Uh, there is this definition and this, uh, th this thing there, uh, which is uh, an another lesson we should have learned from the recent past is that the development of richer or more powerful programming languages was a mistake in the sense that these baroque monstrosities, these conglomeration of idiosyncrasies are really unmanageable both mechanically and mentally. I see a great future for very systematic and very modest programming languages. Do you know when this thing has been said? Which decade? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, that's 1972. <laughs> and who said it? Digital. <laughs> okay, so it's not a new idea, of course. Uh, so the idea is that uh, a DSL is targeted to a particular kind of problem with a specific set of notation, textual, graphical, support, and so on. And it promises more efficient languages for resolving a specific set of problems in a domain. And each concern is described in its own language. The idea is to reduce the abstraction gap. What do we call the abstraction gap? The abstraction gap is the, the, the gap between the problem space, what the user wants, and the solution space, what is built. Okay? And so the idea is that, uh, of course, going uh, through the abstraction, you can reduce a little bit this gap. <coughs> so, DSL have a very long history. They have been uh, there uh, almost for almost as long as computing uh, uh, has been done. Actually, you are all using DSLs if you are doing some kind of activity that is related to programming. Uh, um, but pr maybe you do not recognize them uh, 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 yet as, uh, as DSLs because they have many different forms uh, and we are going to see them. And, uh, and of course, one of the questions that is interesting me is that uh, more and more people are building DSL, how can we help them? So an example of DSL, HTML of course, is DSL for web markup, CSS for styling, uh, make files for the, all the guys in, in this room, uh, for, building, uh, for building software, uh, regular expression, this, is, this one is quite well known, okay, for pattern matching over strings. Uh, uh, graph visualization, uh, notation for chess, which is not really in, on, on, the, on the domain of, uh, of computers, but still is very, very used for describing uh, chess. Uh, Air, which is a DSL for, for people doing statistics. Uh, okay, uh, DSL is not necessarily a niche language. You have Air with more than 2 million users. Okay, uh, SQL for database queries, but they are more than that because they exist under different shapes. 
that's due to Martin Fowler disclassification. We can call them external DSLs. For instance, if you get back to, D, to SQL, D, to SQL, the, the idea is that they have their own syntax and domain-specific tools. It's very nice for non-programmers because you do not have to learn programming to use this particular tool. Okay? Uh, it's very good for separation of concern because you have something which is very isolated from the rest of the system you're building. But it's not that good for integration because you know, building a system, having a part of DSL and the other part in C++ is, you know, there are mismatches. It's not that easy. So the next idea is to have uh, uh, embedded or internal DSLs, which is now possible with some languages that makes it possible to embed somehow a DSL inside the main language. You can have that in Scala or in C Sharp. For instance, here you have in C Sharp an example of, of actually programming in SQL within C Sharp. Okay, so the integration is much better because you're inside one programming language, but at some point you're, switch, you're inside, switch, inside C Sharp and you're switching to SQL. So the idea is that it's, it's, it's very good for the gurus because there are many traps, especially if you're programming that in Scala. In Scala it's very nice, but you know, it's very easy to, to mix things up. Uh, it's very hard for most of the normal users who are not programmers. But the integration is actually excellent because there is an embedding of the semantics. We, I mean, the compiler kn exactly knows what, what it is doing. Okay. And then there is a third way of, of using DSL, which is what followers call implicit DSLs. It's just APIs. For him, APIs are DSLs. And actually, you can turn APIs in, in something that looks more into a DSL by using so-called fluent APIs where each call returns the, 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 the object that you can call again. So it makes it possible to, as let's say, for instance, in Java, to program like in, S in SQL in Java by having, uh, well, th that's the, the, the implicit one with using the API, but you have this version using the, 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 the Fluent API, and you basically can see the something which is really close to the SQL sy normal syntax. Okay, so that's very good for the programmer. If you're a programmer, that's just your dream, what you're doing every day in any world because you're using to, to use APIs. That's uh, very good for integration because there is no, no, no question of integration, but it's very bad for separation of concern and for VNV because it's actually very difficult to check that statically. Of course, there are tools, but if you make an error, if you have a mistake here somehow, uh, that's, that's, that's not going to be seen by the compiler and that's very easy from, the, that's very hard from the security perspective because it's very easy to change one of these strings to do something, so something different. Okay. <coughs> Another example of, of, of a DSL, C. Uh, well, C it's also a GPL, so then what's the difference? Okay, in the past some people uh, say that uh, uh, the difference was that uh, uh, DSL had to be uh, Turing incomplete, incomplete. That should be the difference, but it's no longer the case. I mean, the community is saying that it's not really the case. And so it's not always black and white. There is a gray scale of what is a DSL, what is not a DSL. Actually, it's not very important. The point is that in reality, people are, are using many different languages for building stuff, and they are using languages that are fit for the purpose of what they are doing at some specific point. Get back to this example of uh, J-Hipster, 40 different languages, why they are there? Because, I mean, programmers in the trenches, they feel that is the best way to do it. Okay, there is no big theory behind them, it's just the way they do it. <coughs> so, where does software go with, with these DSLs? Uh, a DSL program is a three-dimensional abstraction. It's an abstraction from the domain because it abstracts something from the domain that you're trying to represent. It's domain knowledge that you're trying to represent. And because it is an abstraction, it's wrong. Okay, again. So that's, you know, uh, Newton theory, again, it's, it's, it's not wrong, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a good approximation of, of the physics up to a certain point. Okay, and a DSL, what you can express of, uh, in a DSL is always that. A good approximation up to a certain point. Okay, then you have uh, an abstraction from the function and uh, an abstraction from the platform, from the, from, from the machine. And so one thing is that you have to embrace uncertainty. Uh, and that's also reflecting some of the previous talk. Uh, the idea is that with smaller abstraction that you can master, you know what you do not know. And that's very important. You know the boundaries. 
you know what are your assumptions and you know what are the limits okay so you can better know and control what is unknown to you and then you can apply rigorous method to uncertain systems to get results that are valid stati statistically or with, with some probabilities and so on and so on, to get non uncertainties okay that's one of the big thing i think in, in computers in, in in the next year is to better to forget this idea that it's one or zero okay but because it, that's true in mathematics but it's not true in software and in computers in computers you have something that is good enough up to a certain point but you have to qualify how good enough it is you know you have to know how good it is and of course for doing that you have to use rigorous method there is no other way so okay so that was my introduction <laughs> you know it's like in the in the in the movie uh, the, the meaning of life you know the Monty Python they started with a very smart introduction that that actually lasts one hour but of course mine is much less funny but that's the, that's the point so now I will jump into the the, the, the core of this talk uh, what's my goal I mean not just mine but the, the goal of the community and, and my team and so on which is how to to make it possible for the masses for all the people and not just programmers probably there are many more non-programmers than programmers in the world so how to make it possible for them to build DSLs and to use DSLs which is turns how to turn how to make it possible for people to turn their domain knowledge the, the thing they know about the world the rules and the, the, the modeling of the world into stuff that can be used within a computer that is tools <coughs> the first thing to realize is that a DSL is software in the sense that when you're producing a DSL it's a language but uh, it's not an abstract thing if you want it to be useful you, it has to be supported by software editors compilers checkers interpreters tools okay and so what we want to do is to have a, a, a fabric for producing these tools okay not producing them by hand but producing them uh, using some engineering method and because they are software they suffer from all the same things that normal software does suffer which is versioning variance and of course separation of concerns and composition just to give you an idea of why they have variance and version and so on the typical life cycle of a dsl if you look at what people are doing it starts typically with a very simple configuration mechanism you have this very huge library very complex so you're going to provide a way for user to configure this library okay let's say video processing you take the ffmpeg and you have many many options many possible options for doing uh, video encoding uh, so it goes more and more complex so typically what you do is that you have a configuration file okay that is a way to avoid repeating all these common lie options so the command file contains a, s a sequence of options uh, equals pair values, one for each line, and then you have comments, and then you have conditionals, and you have macros, and then you have loops, and soon enough you turn in, you turn it into a Turing complete language. Okay, and people do not even realize that they are doing that because it's helpful, it's practical, and it's easy, and then they end up with a Turing complete language. <coughs> So that's for variants, for versioning. So uh, DSL do evolve. They start from something very simple. And if you look at well-known languages such as PHP, for instance, it started as a very, very, very simple way of making it easier to provide HTML pages. Okay, and then it evolved as a big monster doing plenty of stuff in a weird way. Uh, another thing is variants. In a single DSL, you may have different variants for different purposes. One well-known example is, the, is state charts, state charts, state automaton. Uh, there are more than 50 different variants of state charts that have been reported. That differs on uh, whether they, you are allowed what kind of transition, uh, whether you need uh, embedded states, substates, and the like, and many different constructs. And there are more than 50 different variants. Okay. Uh, there is variance on the concrete syntax, whether you are using uh, you know, graphics, uh, text, and so on. But there is also variance in, in, in the semantics. There is this well-known example 
of uh, inner and outer uh, transition priority that has been described in this paper by, uh, by uh, Jürgen Dingol and, uh, and others. You have these state charts here, and at some point there is the event E. And when the event E happens with the state chart, what is the next state of, of, the, of, the, um, of, the, of the state chart? If you're using UML, it's going to be S4. If you're using Rhapsody, it's S5. And if you're using state flow, it's going to be S6. That sounds strange. But actually, if you look, if you look deeply into it, all these tools have a very good reason for that. It's not an error. It's design. The reason why it's there, for instance, with Rhapsody is because, you know, people are using that as the main way of, uh, of describing the dynamic of systems. And so it makes it possible to have interruptible, I mean, interrupts, basically. Whereas in UML, the idea is that state charts are using connected to object-oriented design. And if you want to use the state pattern, then you, the structure of the state pattern makes it necessary to have this way of uh, uh, this other, this inversion of priority there. So it makes complete sense. Is it really a problem? No. I mean, ju you just have, if you have a, 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 code a code generator, you just have to handle this, this variability. It's not that difficult. It's that people who are doing that using product line for, for more than 20 years. So it's not a big issue. But you do not, it's, it's impossible to ignore. Okay. So for instance, when the way people from product line would model that is through what they call a, a, a variability uh, a model, uh, saying that there is the, this, uh, this state machine here, there may be uh, ch different choice for the syntax. Uh, the structure can be either simple or hierarchical. Uh, there might be the presence of initial state, fi final state, and so on. And there might be a semantics with either inner priority or outer priority. So it's easy to model and actually to build a tool where you can choose what is your, the configuration of your language that you want. Okay. <coughs> and then I would like to mention that for when you have several tools, when you have several uh, DSLs, you want them to cooperate. So there is this uh, uh, GMOC initiative that has been launched by my colleague uh, Benoit Combal. Uh, the idea is that to have tools and methods for interoper interoperable, collaborative, and composable modeling languages. And there is a, uh, um, uh, a tool within the Eclipse uh, framework that does that, but I won't enter in, in, the, in the detail of that. So the idea is that to go from craft to engineering of DSLs, uh, from supporting a single DSL to supporting multiple DSLs, with editors, parsers, simulators, compilers, and uh, checkers, refactoring tools, converters that, that are very, you know, uh, costly to build. Uh, on, I mean, each time for each DSL, so we must do some kind of reuse there uh, to support multiple DSLs that interact together. They have several flavors, variants, and they evolve over time. We have product line of DSLs. Uh, so our goal is to ease the definition of tool supported DSLs families. Uh, how to uh, ease and validate the definition of, of DSLs and, and their tools, how to correctly reuse existing tools, and basically to bring the external design, uh, DSL design abilities to the masses using the object-oriented paradigm, and actually using this notion of DSL for building DSLs. The idea is that DSL is just a software, so there are many different concerns. You can see the fact that there are uh, compilers, checkers, interpreters, uh, editors and so on as different aspects of a DSL, different concern that must be described with their own languages that you must compose. So it's just using the idea of DSL at the meta level, if you wish. <coughs> so that's the, 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 the Eclipse modeling galaxy with many different kind, uh, kind of tools for handling that. So I want to do in, in the detail of that. Just, I mean, just a, a, a very a small uh, one, uh, a very small example of what we are doing. It's called Melange, Melange uh, a meta language for modular and reusable development of DSLs, the work, the PhD thesis of uh, to Thomas de Gaulle. And the idea is that to build DSLs out of other DSLs, okay, to reuse DSLs, part of DSL. So he has defined an algebra by which you can slice a DSL, compose DSLs, and uh, combine DSLs, basically. The idea is that these DSLs have, have, are described with abstract syntax and semantics. And semantics can be uh, denotational or, or, I mean, uh, um, uh, translational or, or, in, uh, or uh, interpretative somehow, operational. Uh, and then 
you can consider this, these as le legacy artifacts and you build languages by combining parts. So the idea is that you can merge uh, these parts to provide languages and compose with uh, part of these languages. And you have a number of operators such as merging languages, inheriting languages by extending them with new, con with new concepts, and slicing languages by taking a part of the language but not the rest. Okay? And the idea is that when you're building a DSL, typically there are parts that you want to reuse, for instance, the, the, the part that is the expression language, you know, additions and uh, multiplication and the like. It's stupid to recreate it from scratch each time. So let's take a language that already has them and reuse that part. Okay, that's the basic idea of what we are trying to do. So I um, don't have time to, to, to go into the details, but basically the idea is uh, that you compose a language by composing parts, you know, written in different languages. And if you want to uh, add some, uh, some stuff such as, uh, you know, a new, a new, an extension of a, for, for a finite state language machine with a simple guards, then you add stuff and you import new stuff to create a language. It's not just the static part, but it's also come with the semantics. And what we call the semantics here is very operational in the sense that it's a part of a compiler or a part of an interpreter that is integrated with the rest. Okay. Uh, but it could be also part of tool, to part of a checker, or whatever. Okay, so I want, I will skip that for because it's starting to be the end of the of this presentation. Uh, so there is this website uh, of Melange and, and so on. Uh, it's open source. It's uh, it's uh, written with an EMF extend and so on. Okay, and the question is that uh, does it work in practice? Okay, so there is this. This thing by Linus Torvald that I uh, like very much. Talk is cheap. Show me the code. So here's the code. So th th these are examples of of tools that of DSL-based tools that have been built with uh, with uh, this Eclipse uh, environment. Do not just our tools because it's very large and we are using many different kinds of tools. But for instance, here uh, something which is dedicated to uh, uh, collaboration with Inra, uh, which is uh, how to model farms basically. Uh, my colleague called it the, the co-DSL uh, for, for hunting cause. And, and that's, that's the idea of modeling a farm with connection with uh, meteo provisions and uh, knowledge about crops and, and the like, and ma making it possible to optimize the, the usage in, in a farm in a way that is meaningful for, uh, I mean, for, for the farmer. Uh, he's able to describe his parcels and the way they are connected and so on. Another example is water fluid prediction here. Yet another example is a NabLab environment, uh, which is there, uh, which is used by, uh, by people trying to do uh, some kind of uh, uh, some simulation. You can see that you can do some beautiful uh, mathematic-like uh, uh, simulation there. And that's a DSL. I mean, the, there is syntax and semantic, which is fully defined within Eclipse, that you can provide a LaTeX view and another view, which is a graph view of the same thing. So actually, it's technology that is uh, working. It's still you know, a little bit prototype somehow, but it's, it's already uh, uh, you know, usable. And there are many users who are actually using, uh, using that. OK, so there are some open challenges. We still have a, a huge diversity and complexity of DSL relationships. Uh, uh, far beyond the structural behavior alignment, you have also refinement decomposition and separation of concerns and zoom in, zoom out into, in, in, into details. There are many issues around live and collaborative metabolizing, you know, how to build uh, DSL in, in a better way. And there are also uh, uh, the idea, which is very important, is that w w what I've been saying from the beginning is that there is uh, domain knowledge, meaning that there is some expert who is not a computer scientist, we know something about the world, and we are going to help him define his language for providing a specific model for a specific problem. Okay? So it's a priori knowledge. And we know that there is this very successful other way of building models, which is learned models, learning models out of data. And one of the big things we think is to try to compose a priori knowledge in given in the term, the kind of model I've been talking from the beginning, with these learned models. And that's very useful for many kind of, uh, of application where you need actually a composition of, what, of a priori knowledge with learned data uh, for, for a particular implementation. And then, you know, there are many, many different things that you want to do here. So I jump to the conclusion where uh, here 
the, 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 the big challenge is, you know, uh, this slide from supporting a single DSL to supporting multiple DSLs and a product line of DSLs, families evolving over time uh, and the like. And one of the big issue is, mm, I mean, of DSL, of course, is that if you try to build, you know, 40 different languages, you do not want to pay 40 different language development from scratch because otherwise it's impossible, it's too costly. So you, you need to reuse existing parts and co to compose existing parts. Okay. So my final slide, which is a blatant advertisement because actually it was just, you know, trying to sell my book. Okay. Uh, so if you're interested into the details, just buy the book. I'm getting rich by writing books, as you know. Um, so, but it's not just my ideas, of course, it has been de uh, uh, developed by many colleagues in my teams, and uh, that is the diverse team uh, at Iriza in Thank you very much. <laughs>